Video games have a lot about them that people just kind of accept because if you think about some of this stuff too much, it'll drive you nuts. Things like experience points, leveling up, respawning, and so much more show up in pretty much every game or at least RPG out there in some way, and a lot of it just doesn't make sense. Elden Ring is no different. There's so many gameplay mechanics and contrivances, and you just kind of have to roll with it. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 Elden Ring game concepts that make no sense. Important before we get going to say that this is stuff that's in a game that wouldn't make sense in real life. And that doesn't make it bad. Like, video games are built on mechanics, and for the most part, everything we're getting into here is stuff that makes Elden Ring more interesting. So, keep in mind this is tongue-in-cheek, we're not hating on the game, we're just taking game logic and applying it to real life, and noting how it doesn't work. Starting off at number 10 is the Rebirth Monuments. If there's one single mechanic in Elden Ring that shows how it's more forgiving from previous From Software games, it's this one. Being able to summon helpers to take on difficult encounters and bosses is a great addition, and it gives players even more interesting rewards in the form of spirit ashes you can collect and use. All that stuff is great, but when you stop to think about the whole thing from the actual in-game reason why any of this works, it's, it's a little flimsy. The main issues revolve around these rebirth monuments. Now, you can't summon spirits unless you're close to one, which makes sense from a gameplay perspective. It'd probably be really unfair if you could just summon guys whenever you wanted. But if someone's a reliant on these things being around, it begs the question, why are all these things still standing? If I were a boss and I were just sitting around my arena waiting for people to challenge me, that'd probably be the first thing I smashed. Oh, there's a rebirth monument here, but this is my lair. Yeah, they don't do that. They apparently have no survival instincts at all because they, they don't even think about destroying these things, even after a long time of just sitting there looking at it, let alone the second they saw them. If it was me, it would be the second I saw them. I can't see myself settling into my new boss lair without getting rid of, you know, the rebirth monuments as a boss enemy. Because unlike the Sights of Grace, it seems like they actually are visible to everyone. So to me, it just seems like there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why enemies or bosses would allow these things to continue to stand. Especially with bosses, there's literally all always one of these things around when you fight them, so either they have a death wish or they're extremely cocky. It's a tiny little statue, just smash it. Not one of them has done that. Or maybe there was so many of them around, they got rid of most of them, but didn't realize there was still one hanging around. All of them made that same mistake? Yeah, I don't think so. Obviously, it's a gameplay contrivance to make the game work the way they want it to do, but in real life, these things would be gone, like, instantaneously. At number 9, when there is an equipment weight limit, but a bottomless inventory. This is an issue in pretty much every From Software game, but it's in Elden Ring, so we gotta point it out. Long story short, equipment has weight, so you can only equip so much stuff, and it weighs you down. Unless it's just in your pocket, apparently. Like, if you've played any of these games, all the Souls games, except Demon Souls, pretty much, sort of, you know exactly what we're talking about. Weight is a big deal in Elden Ring, and depending on how heavy your armor and weapons are, it can have a huge effect on your movement speed and dodging abilities. So if you want to use a super heavy weapon or a shield, you may have to compromise on how heavy the armor you're wearing is, or vice versa. And nobody wants to be fat rolling, it's just undignified. That's all fine. It makes more sense than most RPGs, but what doesn't make sense is that as long as you're not wearing a weapon or armor, you can haul around as much stuff as you want. By the end of the game, you'll have like hundreds of weapons and pieces of armor in your inventory, and you're able to get around just fine. But if you want to use them, we're going to have a problem. They never explain this. Like they could give you a, a mystical bag that can hold tons of stuff. There could be some lore oriented reason for why inventory doesn't weigh you down. But once you equip it, it does. But no, it's just a thing you can do. It's the age old. How does the doom guy hold so many weapons problem? But taken to the next level. It's even more ridiculous when you factor in certain item limits. Certain consumable weapons only allow you to carry so many at a time in your inventory, like throwing daggers. Sure, you can lug around dozens of armor sets on your body somehow, but 30 little throwing daggers? Uh-uh. No, it's too much. Obviously, again, it's purely a gameplay thing. Demon Souls had a separate inventory load you had to worry about, and that was also pretty annoying. So I'm actually glad it's gone from every game that followed it. But the whole thing's, I mean, it's ridiculous if you think about it.
And number eight, when you need a cookbook to make obvious stuff, there's always a certain level of suspension of disbelief you have to accept whenever there's a crafting mechanic in a game, and Elden Ring is not different. Depending on what you're making, your character's either a master craftsman or a barely functioning caveman, and it all comes down to what cookbook you have. Elden Ring isn't quite as crazy as some games. You know, I'm making a supercomputer by jamming a computer chip and some metal together, but there's still some stuff that leaves us scratching our heads. Like, how does an earth leaf flower and some human bone shards make a grace mimic? I don't, I don't understand that, but okay. It goes the other way too. For all the items that seem impossible to make, there's stuff here that any idiot should be able to cobble together. But of course you can't until you have the proper cookbook. Seriously, do you need instructions to make a fetid pot? It's literally just some poop in a pot. I think you'd probably be able to make that without a detailed set of instructions. In previous Souls games, your character was perfectly capable of throwing a handful of poop at their enemies all by itself, but an Elder Ring needed a recipe to literally explain how to throw poop. If monkeys do it in the wild with no instructions, your character in Elden Ring should be able to as well. At number seven is fall damage. In video games, you never really know how dangerous a fall is. In real life, we have a pretty good idea how far is too far, but in the world of gaming, anything really can go. Some games will kill you after falling a few feet. Some games you can fall forever and never die. It's basically a free-for-all. Elden Ring is somewhere in the middle. You can fall pretty far and survive, but if you ever drop further than 20 meters, that's pretty much it. You're done. We could complain about the inconsistent damage scaling when it comes to falling, or the odd ways that your stats affect how much damage you take from falls, but if there's one thing that really just doesn't make sense about fall damage in Elden Ring, it's that sometimes falling just doesn't hurt you at all. There are a few places in the game where falling's perfectly safe, usually in spots with some kind of trap or breakable floor. It would make at least a little bit of sense if these spots didn't have very long drops and this was just a way to mitigate some unavoidable damage, but no. Take this fall in the Divine Tower of Kaelid, that's a fall that almost definitely would kill you anywhere else, but it doesn't do anything at all. Why? Because the game says so. Honestly, these spots where you can survive deadly falls are pretty cool little moments on their own, but in terms of how the logic goes, it just doesn't make sense. The only reason you don't die here is because... It's a no fall damage zone, that's all. And number six, bosses that get more health when you summon help. This is another thing that's a, a, a long running souls mechanic that makes perfect sense in terms of game design, but it doesn't make any sense in terms of like real logic. As you're probably aware, boss in these games get a lot tougher if you fight them in co-op. Add an additional person and it may boost their HP by 50% and make them do a lot more damage. So they're already a lot tougher with two people and it only gets worse from there. Obviously it's a gameplay balance thing. Just having an extra person around to distract the boss gives you a big advantage advantage, so to scale up the boss accordingly to make more of a challenge. In gameplay terms, it makes perfect sense, but make the assumption this is how it went in real life. Why do these guys just suddenly get tougher because somebody else is around? Is it a Dragon Ball situation where they're holding back because it's just one guy and now they're taking the limiters off to show you their true power level? All we can really do is speculate because there's no explanation. Either bringing in more help just pisses these guys off so much that they put up more of a fight, or eh, I don't know. No explanation. Obviously, it doesn't really matter. You can just go with it because it makes sense in the game in terms of balance, but it also doesn't make sense. And number five is bell bearings, a, a baffling mechanic. For whatever reason, everyone who sells stuff in this world carries an item called a bell bearing, and if you kill them, you can give those items to these two mummified corpses in the round table hold, which then allows you to buy that person's item. Uh, which what? There's so much about this that makes no sense whatsoever. What even are these bell bearings? Why does everyone have them? Why does giving this thing to a corpse do anything? How are these transactions working? Like, look at this thing. They literally never speak, move, or do anything. You're just interacting with a dead body, and somehow you're exchanging items. I mean, if we get in the nitty gritty of it, how do you buy anything in this game? How exactly are runes exchanged? Do you keep them in your pocket? Can you somehow transfer them over using some kind of magic? It's never really explained, and while that alone doesn't make sense, the bell bearings and everything that surrounds them makes less sense. It's a great mechanic, don't get me wrong, you never lose your shopkeeper stuff, but the logic of it just, it's anyone's guess. And number four is talisman pouches. Uh, this is kind of petty, but why do you need special pouches to carry talismans? I mean, everybody makes fun of the two slash four ring limit in Dark Souls games. What's the excuse here? Unlike in previous Souls games where you could equip either two or four rings right from the word go, in Elden Ring, you start with one talisman slot and unlock more as the game goes along. It adds a simple and satisfying layer of progression to the game, but like so many progression systems, the actual logic of it does, does not add up. 
You're already carrying around a dozen talismans already. Why do they need to be in a special pouch to actually get any benefits from them? How you get them, pretty suspect too. Sure, I can accept Margaret having one of these things on him, but Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, he's literally a ghost, but somehow beating him gets you a new equipment slot. Yeah, it's 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 another one of those things, just a blatant gameplay contrivance. But the fact that there's an actual item you get in the world of the game makes it stand out as being a little nonsensical. And number three is the arcane stat. If there's one stat in Elden Ring that leaves us scratching our heads, it's gotta be the arcane stat. Okay, so leveling up stats already doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, what exactly is supposed to be happening when you level up anyways? But ignoring all that, the arcane stat is particularly confusing. Like the strength stat we get. You do more physical damage, you improve your physical defense, endurance, increases your stamina, and affects how heavy your weapons and armor can be. Vigor, total health, I get it. But arcane is just kind of a weird catch-all. It's mostly a magic stat that affects spells and incantations, but it improves your luck in finding items as well, which is a little unusual. But on top of that, it also increases the amount of bleed buildup a weapon causes. That's the one that really gets me. How does Arcane, a magic stat, affect how quickly a weapon causes someone to bleed? You'd think that the weapon itself would be the only thing that can really affect how much it cuts, but apparently not. Have high enough Arcane and suddenly everyone's a hemophiliac. And number two is the magic coffins. For the most part, every location in Elden Ring connects in a logical way. It's not Dark Souls 2 where you take an elevator from a windmill up into a volcano castle somehow. Pretty much everything connects in a way that makes sense. Except when it comes to these things, dubbed by the community as magic coffins. There are a few of them in the world, mostly underground, and none of them make any sense whatsoever. It all seems to be at least somewhat by design, like this one that lets you go inside of it and sends you up a waterfall. I mean, that seems like like it's clearly not supposed to make sense on purpose. If they wanted to, they could have just linked some of these disparate areas using standard teleport things once in a while, but instead they gave you this cool little cutscene where you get in a coffin and it takes you somewhere. How these things work is pretty easy to explain away as just being magic, and honestly that's enough for me. But considering how much time and effort the developers put into making everything in the world feel realistically connected, these magic coffins stand out as a bit of a break in the logic of the game world. A cool break, but still a break. And finally, at number one, the whole end game. To call the narrative of Elden Ring mysterious would be an understatement, but for the most part, the story progression makes sense. You start off at the bottom of the world and you have to make your way up to the royal capital. That's where the throne is and you want to become the new boss, so you have to go and confront the old boss. Simple as that. Pretty straightforward, but when you actually get to the Erd Tree Throne, you're stopped by a wall of thorns and it's then explained you have to burn down the tree to actually get through the barrier. Again, makes sense in the logic of the game world, so you go up to this gigantic thing called the Forge of the Giants and start a big fire. All right, stuff gets weird here. Now you're suddenly in a floating city called Faramazula, a place that's barely been mentioned and is, in terms of the map is like far, far away from the rest of the world. And now you're trying to get something called Destined Death from a guy, which apparently will do something. I, I guess. I'm not even going to get into what you actually fight in the end game. It's a From Software staple to have these baffling out of nowhere bosses at this point. So it's not that big of a shocker, at least to me, that what you fight at the end is not expected. But all this stuff combined, it's really confusing. Why does starting up the forge teleport you to a floating city? It's one of the coolest places in the game. No complaints about the place itself, but it feels like they forgot to come up with an actual way to get you here. So you just sort of get teleported here just because. The whole end game has a whole Whole lot of crazy stuff go down but if you're following along closely there is actually some stated reason why all this stuff is happening oh the beast clergyman actually malekith oh godfrey shows up for real then snaps the neck of a lion that's floating behind him by the time you actually get into the erd tree everything becomes pretty much totally abstract feels like a fever dream it's just nuts all around that's all for today leave us a comment let us know what you think if you like this video click like if you're not subscribed now's a great time to do so we upload brand new videos every day of the week best way to see them first is of course a subscription so click subscribe don't forget to enable all notifications and as always we thank you very much for watching this video i'm falcon you can follow me on twitter falcon the hero we'll see you next time right here on game ranks time right here on